my background there. And I think it's um, quite useful to mention that I started out as a software engineer in computing, so obviously I have a background in psychology as well. Um, but I used to work as a software engineer and then uh, moved back into research. So I do a lot of research into human-computer interaction with people like Google and the BBC. So I, I spend a lot of my time doing that, but I now also teach software engineering and, and I spend a lot of time working with industry while I do that as well. So what I want to talk about today is um, the pragmatic approach to evaluation that we have to take when we're developing software. So um, we've talked about controlled user studies, I think I know Veronica was talking about that last week, um, and it's really, really useful to have that as, to kind of refer back to as, as a baseline for, you know, in an ideal world, this is how we'd be doing our research. But in terms of software development, it's, it's often not possible or not appropriate to use that kind of evaluation. So what, what do we do when we're developing software? And I want to think about things from that perspective. Okay, so today I'm going to race through, firstly, what we mean by evaluation when it comes to software development. Um, and then I want to talk about who we should be evaluating with, how we should evaluate, um, when we should evaluate and where we should be doing our evaluation. So I want to try and get through that as quickly as possible and then hopefully um, answer some questions at the end if people have any because I often find that actually it's, it's more useful when you've got a very limited time period to kind of get some um, feedback from people in terms of what they actually want to know. So, okay. What do we mean by evaluation in a software development context? Well, we might be talking about a comparative evaluation. So I think this is the kind of evaluation um, you've been learning about so far. So we're um, comparing X with Y, for example. So um, is this user interface better than this one? Is this search facility better than this one? Um, we'll come to what we mean by better in a second. Um, and that's great. And, and often you can collect numbers, you can collect things like task completion times, and you can perform statistics to understand whether there's a difference. And this is, this is great when you have that kind of situation when that's appropriate to use that. But a lot of the time, you don't have a comparison, you don't have a baseline, you're just trying to develop some software that works. Um, and so we have to approach our evaluation in a completely different way there. So in that situation, evaluation usually means um, checking that the software meets requirements. So does it pass acceptance tests that we've kind of defined as being um, what our software needs to do in order to, to meet requirements and be signed off? Acceptance tests obviously aren't the only thing, so, so from a contractual perspective they're important, but we also want our software to be really usable too. So we want people to find it easy to use and to be happy using it, because otherwise um, then, then you know, it's less likely they're going to use it in the future. So we want to run a usability evaluation as well, um, and that's something else I'm going to talk about briefly. Okay, so just before I talk about usability and give you a definition for usability, um, I want to just talk very quickly about who we should be evaluating with. So I know that Mashuda um, has mentioned the granny test, so this is a very useful one for, to keep in mind, especially when you're developing software for the public at large, so you should consider um, who um, who the users who are likely to have most trouble, you hypothesize with your software, um, so younger people, older people, people with disabilities who have to access the computer in different ways, these are all people, useful people to test with. Um, but if you're developing very um, specific software for a particular business, then you really need to um, have those users test your software. So if you're developing software for a call centre or a bank or for some kind of you know, scientific process, um, somewhere where there'll be a domain expert using the software, then it's absolutely vital that they are the people who are in the evaluation. And I mean the people who will be using the software as well and not their managers. So not the customer, but the user. It's very common uh, in a software development situation to have a manager commission software and we'll say it needs to work in this very particular way. And people, uh, their are um, reading of the process will be about right. They have some idea of the business process, but it won't necessarily be completely accurate. So. For example, if you're talking about um, a call centre and you're developing what we call customer relationship management software, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, 
if you have a manager talk about the process, they might say something like, okay, well, we would normally search on customer number if we're looking for a customer account. Um, so most people have their number, but sometimes they don't. So, so in that case, we'd, we'd search on their name instead in the first instance. And eventually, you come around to testing it with um, one of the users, one of the account managers, and they say, well, no, that's not what we do in this situation, because um, actually for this particular product, there's likely to be only one person at a particular address. So we'd, we'd always go for address first, and that's what we'd, we'd search on rather than customer name. Um, so it seems like a minor detail, but these things actually can cost a lot of time um, when we're when somebody's actually using software in a kind of time critical way um, and affect the business process. So it's really important that we have exactly the right person evaluating the software. Okay, so let me see if I can share my screen with you now. Um, try this. And we want. Half an hour later, get there in a minute. Where are we? Okay, we want this one. Let's try it. Let's do this. Okay, hmm. let's swap the displays. Okay, I'm hoping, <laughs> I've not got any feedback here, hoping that you're seeing the right thing now. Okay, so this is the ISO standard for usability. It's quite dry. I don't want to spend too long looking at it, um, but it's useful to have it, I think. Okay, so. According to ISO, usability is the effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction with which specified users achieve specified goals in particular environments. So it's quite specific. So effectiveness is the accuracy and completeness with which specified users can achieve specified goals in particular environments. Efficiency refers to the resources expended in relation to the accuracy and completeness of the goals achieved. And satisfaction refers to the comfort and acceptability of the system to its users and other people affected by its use. Okay, so I think it's really important to reflect on these for a moment. So one of the first things that you'll spot is that there's an implication that all of these things can be measured. So we can measure effectiveness, we can measure efficiency, and we can measure satisfaction. So effectiveness is basically whether or not somebody can complete the task. Efficiency is usually how quickly can they complete the task. And satisfaction refers to um, how enjoyable they find the system to use and also how comfortable they find it to use. So. Let's not look at that anymore. Um, right. OK. Let's try that one. OK. Now, Mashuda, can you nod if you can see me again? Excellent. Good. So it's the first time I've done this. OK, right. So. Um, there's this implication we can measure these things, and, and we can. So we're looking at things like speed, whether or not people complete tasks. We might want to give them a questionnaire afterwards to find out how satisfying they find something was. And it's important that we think about always evaluating on these three dimensions. So efficiency is important uh, because how quickly we can do something often affects the business process. So it's important to keep that in mind. It's not necessarily the most important thing, though. So we, we obviously need to know that somebody can complete a particular task. So we need to know that the, the software is going to support that. Um, whether they can complete it quickly um, is not necessarily the key thing. So if you think about a command line interface, for example, some people are very keen on um, the command line and would like to use it for everything, and, and I respect that view. But most people probably would prefer to use a graphical interface for a lot of um, graphical user interface for um, a lot of um, function functionality. So it might be that you prefer moving files um, using an explorer, uh, and other people prefer doing it on the command line, and it's probably quicker on the command line if you know what you're doing. But if you're somebody who prefers to see what you're doing, um, you're quite a visual person, and you prefer to organize things that way, um, then you're always going to go for the graphical user interface. So in that situation, satisfaction comes from um, being able to do something in, in a comfortable way, and you prioritize that over efficiency. I think another thing that's uh, useful to think about in terms of satisfaction is that um, 
when we're looking at websites, so we're talking about how easy it is for somebody to find something on a website, for example, the perceived attractiveness of the website, so how nice it is to look at, all other things being equal, um, doesn't affect how easy it is to find information. So effectiveness and efficiency aren't affected by that. But um, satisfaction um, makes a big difference here because people are far less likely um, far less likely to continue searching if they can't find something on an unattractive website, they'll give up more quickly. So, so we can see that satisfaction does make quite a big difference. Okay, right. So those are our dimensions that we're going to think about. How, how are we going to evaluate according to those dimensions? Well, most of the time we'll be thinking about completing particular tasks and, and you would be defining those tasks. So it's important to think about exactly what you're going to get people to do. When you're um, looking at developing software for a relatively well-defined and complex business process, it, it can actually be relatively easy to define the tasks because um, you know exactly what's going to be happening. So you're thinking back to the call centre again, we know that people are going to um, be looking for account details, they want to edit account details, um, and so on. Um, so we've got the tasks fairly well-defined, so we know what to test against. With something like a website, which is providing information, it's actually a lot more difficult to get this right. So we might have um, an idea if we're developing a website for a university that people are going to want to look for, um, prospective students would want to look for um, an overview of the course, and they want to see um, staff and student profiles. So these are the things that we're testing for in our evaluation. And we get to participant six, and it turns out that um, actually those things aren't that important after all, and, and this participant says to us, well, when I'm um, looking uh, for courses uh, on university websites, I, I want to see a detailed syllabus. Um, I'm not really interested in the staff and student profiles, I couldn't care less about those. And so we get them to look for the um, detailed syllabus, and we find actually that it's really difficult for them to find, and they, it's quite a frustrating experience. Um, so if we don't get the tasks right before our evaluation, then we're not going to get accurate information back about how effective our software is. So that's something that's really important to think about. So we talked about um, comparative um, evaluations, but what if you don't have a baseline? What if you're just trying to um, understand you know, how how well your, how easy your software is to use from the perspective, from a subjective perspective, are your customers going to like it? Um, in this case, we might employ a paradigm called Think Aloud. And in Think Aloud, we get somebody to talk about what they're doing as they're using some software. So um, we might have a situation where, see if I can do a screen share for you, and we'll do this again. OK, so I'll just say, OK, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm looking at this presentation at the moment, and I'm going to go back to the previous slide, and I'm going to edit this because I've decided that actually I don't mean this by effectiveness at all, the accuracy and completeness, and uh, and I'm just going to put success in there instead because uh, I think that's, that's a bit quicker. And anyway, so I'm talking about what I'm doing. So this obviously is is um, a fairly artificial example. But you might notice um, when I've been uh, making that edit there and I'm talking about what I'm doing and trying to explain what I'm doing and, and I'm saying things like, oh, actually, I'm, I'm having problems uh, finding the slide that I was looking for before. And I'm articulating these things, but that's affecting um, how, well it's, how well I'm performing the task. So it's making a difference. So the fact I'm, I'm trying to tell you about what I'm doing is going to affect how well I do it. So this is something we need to keep in mind. So one alternative is to, I think I'm back again now. So an alternative to that is to use something that we, something like um, retrospective think aloud. So in retrospective think aloud, you might video someone, you might track their eye movements and then replay that to them and say, okay, um, what happened here? What's going on here? Um, was something going wrong at this particular point? And hopefully they'd just be able to talk you through it, but if there was a particular point in time when you thought they were getting stuck, you can ask them about it. And this is nice because um, it offers an advantage over just interviewing them afterwards because you have a reference point and something to, to jog their memory. So, of course, there are issues with all of these paradigms, and I'm not going to dwell on them now because um, there's still fierce debates about the best one to use. But um, it's interesting to, um, to think about some of the pros and cons, so I'll leave that with you. Okay, so let's go down here. 
So we thought about Think Aloud and retrospective Think Aloud, and these are quite pragmatic things to use when we're evaluating software when we're not performing a, um, a comparison. Um, when, when should we start performing our evaluation? Well, obviously, we, we tend to think about evaluating at the end um, after we've you know, got something in our hands. Um, and this is what we call a summative evaluation, which basically demonstrates. We might use this for demonstrating to a customer that we've fulfilled requirements, the software is better than it was before, um, that it does a good job. But of course, if we're following an iterative development method, um, which we should be, um, we'll hopefully be evaluating all the way through. So we can actually start doing this really quite early on. Uh, I think you've talked about paper prototyping, so this is a good point to start your evaluation. Um, and you could use something called um, a Wizard of Oz method. So in Wizard of Oz, this basically means a person is pretending to be the system. So you could use post-it notes um, to represent parts of your user interface, and somebody will press one of the buttons, and then the person operating the system will switch them around, and they'll move the interface around so people can understand how it's changed. So you can start evaluating, evaluating interactivity um, before you've started doing any, any development at all. So it's great to do that if you can, as it saves time writing code that's not going to be used. OK, so you're hopefully doing that throughout um, the development process. Should you always do it with lots of people? Well, ideally, yes. I mean, if you're in a situation where you can use lots of um, lots of users and, and get um, feedback from lots of people, this is, this is perfect. Um, but in reality, um, it's very time consuming to do that. Um, and not always practical, and the users aren't available, and all, all sorts of problems like this. So evaluating with just one or two actually is OK, and it's much better than not evaluating at all. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're thinking about where you should be evaluating, then again, if we're running a controlled study, it's nice to do it in a controlled environment. So we would want to run something like that in the lab. Um, that's great because we've got all our equipment there and we can video the session and we can use eye tracking if we're going to use that and, and we know exactly what we're getting. The problem is if you're in the lab and it's nice and quiet and nothing's affecting people's interaction with the software and then you move the software into its real environment, which is say a call centre, which is very noisy, where the lighting's different, you know, everything's different, um, then you're not going to get an accurate reflection of the process in the lab. So you'd ideally want to do it in the environment where the software is going to be deployed. So we call that in situ evaluation. And we can also think about evaluating in the wild as well. And I, I think this might have come up last week, actually, in one of the questions. Um, so you can just put software out there. If it's software for public use, put software out there and, and see what people make of it. So it might be on a pilot basis. So the BBC does this quite a lot. They'll release a pilot of a particular software application that will go to certain people um, and get feedback on it. So there are a number of options we have for running remote usability evaluations. Uh, which might include things like um, getting people to do their own screen recordings, getting them to do tasks, getting them to fill in questionnaires afterwards about their experience. Um, one of the issues with this is that um, we don't know how reliable our results are. So they have more ecological validity, um, but we need to be sure that we're getting accurate results back from people. They're not just doing it for the money, for example. Uh, so often people are paid in these situations, and, and we need to make sure that there's somebody who's really going to be interested in using the software and is, is performing the task properly. The other thing we can do is look at um, data analytics. Uh, so this is um, a really great source, rich source of information. So how are people using the application? Um, so this is obviously useful for websites. There are ways you can do it with other forms of software as well, more complicated. Um, and so we get back all this data and we think, OK, great. So we know that people are accessing this bit and, and they're using this and they're going from here to here. But what do we do after that with the data? Understanding exactly what the user goals are is something we can't really do in this situation. So it's very difficult to effectively evaluate against the goals we have in mind. If we think back to the definition, that can be quite problematic. So we can't really evaluate against the goals because we don't know what user goals are. So although we can monitor things like you know, sales rates and hit rates and things like that, um, and if those go up, then usually that's a good thing, um, trying to uh, understand more kind of nuanced aspects of the user interface is quite difficult in this situation. So um, I will stop there uh, because I think I've done about 20 minutes. Um, and uh, I could go on, but uh, it's probably a good time to pause. Thank you.
Okay, have we got any questions from the audience for Caroline? Sorry? Yeah, come up here. Oh, it's not the same as last week. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, can you hear me? I can. It's a very simple question to start with. What's your favourite website or app from a usability point of view at the moment? Oh, right, okay. My favourite website from a usability point of view. Um, oh, it's, it's quite a difficult one. So I like Google. I like the Virtualbox page. I find that's quite useful. Um, it took me a while to come to terms with the um, updating the results. I wasn't sure about that to begin with, but I think I'm, I'm okay with that now. But I think that's quite an interesting point, actually, because um, people tend to like what they're familiar with. So this is a real, real difficulty when it comes to evaluating software. Um, people, if you're comparing against an, the, the baseline of the original software, there is this effect of, of kind of practice that you have to take into account. Often people like something um, just because they're familiar with it. Um, what don't I like? It's easier to come up with ones where you, which you don't like. Do you do you use Blackboard at Loughborough at all? Do you use Blackboard or Moodle? Uh, yeah, we. It's called Learn here. Ah, right. Okay. So, so um, speaking my experience of uh, <laughs> of most kind of online um, course software is terrible. So I'm not online kind of virtual learning environments. The, certainly, the ones we use at Manchester, I, I really don't like at all. Um, so I think that's that's kind of it's always easier to pick out the things that you really hate. Please, do. yeah. Um, so what, what sort of like design paradigm or like you know new technology that's coming out that quite excites you from a usability point of view? I think um, one of the major things that's happened recently that's made um, software um, far more usable is the touch screen. So this is fantastic. So. Um, we find there's a lot of evidence that um, people who struggle using standard desktop computers, so older people and so on, um, actually, and young children, find it very easy to use um, touch screens. So being able to look at something and then touch the thing that you want is, is brilliant. And this, from an interaction perspective, um, this is, is really exciting. So I think this is, this is a great step forward for um, software generally. And I think it's going, we're going to see a lot more of it in the future as well. Um, so whilst on screen keyboards aren't great, um, with the exception of that, I think that uh, this is the where I see a lot of um, desktop computers and stuff moving eventually as well. Sorry, one last one, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> um, so I was going to ask a question about uh, releasing things into the wild last week. I'm not going to argue about that again, but um, yeah, I'm just interested from your work with like the BBC and Google of how, how they go about doing usability studies, because I can imagine people like Facebook haven't got time to hang around doing studies, they just want to get things out. Well, that's interesting. So, so the first thing to point out is that um, Google and Facebook um, spend a great deal of money on performing user studies. But Google's an interesting example. So I know a little bit about um, that. Google don't tell you everything about how they run their studies. I know a little bit about it. What Google do is because they have such a phenomenal number of users, um, they can actually do their tests really, really quickly. So they can say, OK, we're um, developing um, a new user interface. We're going to change our interface in this way. So we're going to just uh, release it to, I don't know, 500,000 people for you know 10 minutes. And they'll get so many results back from that. They'll be able to tell really quickly whether it's something that people can pick up um, intuitively or not. So that's the kind of way that they run their studies. So I think this is kind of the kind of thing that you're suggesting. Um, so if you're in that situation, it's great. So Google are able to do that. And also because they have a monopoly, they can kind of get away with that, that sort of thing as well. Um, with the BBC, the way they often run things, so I, I don't know whether you know about second screen content. So obviously people watch television and then might have an app that kind of supports that um, on, on their mobile phone or their tablet or whatever. Um, and the BBC is currently, and this is something we're working with them at the moment to, to 
uh, help them deploy this. They're not just using interactive apps like um, the kind of, I'm just trying to think, so things like the X Factor app and stuff like that, where people basically are kind of doing things themselves, but actually wanting with documentaries, with drama and so on, to interleave the content between the two devices. So what they do in that situation is they'll run a pilot. So there'll be a few thousand people who are on their kind of database of um, participants um, who they will contact and say, look, do you want to download this app? And when you watch this television program, which will be going out, you know, widely across the nation, try using this at the same time and, and let us know what you think. So they'll do something similar. So it's kind of semi um, semi wild. Uh, so you're getting people to use it in situ, um, but you do it with a limited number of people. Um, so you can get feedback from them. Because of course, if you're getting feedback especially qualitative feedback in that situation where people are talking about um, their comments and their thoughts. You get that from kind of, you know, 60,000 people. Who's going to sit down and go through all that feedback? So, <laughs> you know, you need to think about whether you're actually going to be able to use the data afterwards. Thanks a lot. That's great. Cheers. Thanks. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? No? Okay, in that case, let's thank Caroline for her time. Okay, thank you, Caroline. I'm going to stop the broadcast now, okay? Okay, great. Bye. Bye.